been a great uh, cost when it comes to friends. I thank God for real friends. I remember how Dave said, if you wind up at the end of your life with two or three or four lifelong friends, you really have about the best this world has to offer. And I've really found that to be true. And uh, when we started here at the prayer center, of course we had friends, you know, and some of my, I mean, friends from my youth. And, but when you begin doing this message, you're going to change. And where you walked at one time might have been acceptable. I'm not saying, that, you know. By the way, you can be open up to, yes, Second Timothy chapter 2. <laughs> you know, there's a, there's a time when your walk it may not be, well, it's not perfect. You know, there's the good, acceptable, and perfect. Okay. Well, your way gets narrower as you walk with him. And if you allow the Holy Ghost to purge you, certain things that used to be okay where you were walking, they're just not okay anymore. It's not that you wouldn't have made heaven if you hadn't have changed. But your walk has changed. And Paul does a better job than I'm doing here describing this. And sometimes you have friends that are on the same path because we're, see, if I, if I were just wanting to please you and if, if Dave and, you know, Dave and Tim are smart, they could have a big church here if they wanted to. All they got to do is preach messages that make you happy and tell you how to be blessed by God. And I'm not saying that's even wrong. I'm just saying that's not, that's not the vision we have here. See, the vision we have here is that, yes, sir. Uh, there was an announcement made, my understanding before the service, of a funeral Thursday of a 23-year-old man who loved God, got two little kids, sweet wife. We're going to bury him Thursday. No way on earth is that God's will. There is, I don't, and I thank God he's in heaven. I thank God for the blood of Jesus. I thank God he'll provide for that family. But I'm just telling you, the mission, well, I don't have to tell you, you already know, the mission we have here is to stop that from happening. Amen. That is just, in a nutshell, we, that's our job. Until, until we arrive there, we're pressing toward the mark. And I thank God for the miracles that we do see. We see some, thank God. But Jesus, when he did his meetings, he healed them all. Amen. And when he had his way in these meetings, he'll still heal them all. Okay. So we're not trying to build a big church. We're pressing towards truth. We're trying to walk a more narrow, higher path where the perfect will of our Father can be accomplished through this body. Amen? Well, so that brings us to 2 Timothy chapter 2. And we'll just, I'll start right where uh, Alan did this morning. Oh, I was talking about friends. See, because what will happen as your walk narrows... You walk with him, and he begins to narrow your path. Well, some friends want to go with you. I mean, all of you, we've been on this journey. Some of you, we've been here 20, over 20 years walking this path, and we're still here. Because you, you're after the same thing that I'm after. We're, we're friends. We're on this path together. I'm, not a, I'm certainly not arrived, but I'm pressing. You're pressing. But how many have we lost along the way? See, and some of them were... You know, your acquaintances, you know, you see them at church and then you don't see them. Boy, some of them were friends. And some of them when they, well, some of them they don't always speak real nice of you. When they're not walking with you anymore. That hurts. What's the answer to that? Pray for them. Love them. Pray for them. Do good to them. Amen. I believe that well, that's not the message either. Yes, sir. Father, I, I pray now your spirit come. I mean, I know he's here, but Father, come into my mind in such a way that I, 
I see this message clearly. Let me walk this for your kingdom. In Jesus' name. Amen. 2 Timothy chapter 2, starting in verse 14. Of these things put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord. When he says before the Lord, that takes the instruction of this to, a, to the highest authority that there is. This instruction comes straight from God. This instruction comes from your Lord and Master, Jesus Christ. Timothy, it's your voice, but you're charging them before him. Well, what is that charge? That they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. Study to show thyself approved unto God. Alan labored on that just for a moment. See, who are you seeking approval from? Are you seeking approval from your friends? We all do to some degree. Let's be real. But ultimately, that's not why we do what we do. I'll just go ahead and say this. There's no reason to write that verse if there's not those in ministry who are not approved of God. I didn't get near enough amens right there. Why? They don't study the word. No, they really don't. They wrongly divide it. I want to say it in Gary's terms. And it's not always that their heart is wrong. Sometimes they can have a good heart and butcher the word. That was hard, wasn't it? That's the way the Lord sees it. You butcher the word, you're not approved. You're not ready for prime time. Yeah. There's a ve he's going to get to these vessels. We're going to get to them. I'm, he I'm headed for the vessels, <laughs> like Alan did this morning. But along the way, let's get some truth. There's such a thing as being a minister approved of God and a minister not approved of God. They put themselves there. You know it. You can usually feel it if you're mature at all. And uh, what they're after is you. And that's, you know, when I say it that way, it sounds, well, that sounds okay. No. They're after you and your approval. See, I'm after you, but I'm after you for his approval. I want you accepted by him, not by me. You understand the difference? I'll tell you another thing. I am not after you. Nobody that I know that ministers here is after your money. We are after you. For him. Let me keep reading. <clears throat> Study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. I'm going to stop right there for a moment and just remind you, God did not give you just a book. He gave you a, when I say a book, he did not just give you a book, his word. He gave you a teacher. See, in school, we, our school system got that from God. When you go to school, they don't sit you just in a room with a book. They sit you in a room with a book and a teacher. I was asked a question by a friend yesterday said, well, how come there's so many denominations in Christianity? That's people who study the book without the teacher. And it's just plain English. They're trying to figure out a, the divine mind of God using the finite mind of man. And they have little glimpses of the truth, and it's not that that's absolutely wrong, but it's not the whole truth. So you wind up with slivers of truth, denominations, this Bible does not mean 97 different things. It means one thing. If you get the book and the teacher, he will unconfuse your confusion. <laughs> and you'll also become a workman who doesn't need to be ashamed. You will not butcher the word. You'll teach it in the context and the truth that he gave it in. Okay. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness and they always do they always lead to ungodliness not godliness okay 
And I have to really shun those. And sometimes, you know, God gives you humorous ways of doing it sometimes so you don't hurt people. I don't want to hurt people. But I don't have time. I don't. I, Alan talked about black holes of need. I, I, you know what a black hole is? A black hole sucks. The gravity is so dense. It sucks everything into it, including light. Light itself cannot escape the black hole. But the black hole never, ever changes. It never gets filled. It never says enough. It will suck you to death, and then it goes on to the next one to suck him to death. All of your time, all of your life, all of your resources, all of your money, and then it'll just move on to suck somebody else dry. I have no time for you if you're a black hole. You know how, how I can usually get rid of black holes? Gary, who are they? That is none you for sure. But I've had many. How you get rid of them is give them an instruction from the Word of God. Now, see, I'm a teacher. I'm not a pastor. I don't know how pastors deal with you. <laughs> teachers, I can tell you right now how teachers deal with you. I'll give you an instruction from the Word of God, clear as, clear as day. You do it, we're going on. You don't do it, I'm done. Why would I waste my time on, on you? See, Dave gave me many instructions as my pastor, thank God. But Dave is a pastor slash teacher. Slash more things. <laughs> but you'll get, I don't want to get upset with me. But he would give me instructions. I mean, from the most simple things. Pray in tongues and your life will change. You know how many people come here that hear that and, and want the vision of that, but they don't ever really do that? Do you know those people, if, they, if it was allowed, they would suck Dave dry when it comes to his fellowship and his time and hang around him and they want to be the anointing. They like the anointing that comes off of him. And they would, man, if they were allowed, well, they would, he wouldn't have any time ever for anything. But they're not ever going to do it. Now, see, Dave, because he's got that pastor gift, he'll just keep loving you. I'll be going, I'll block your phone call eventually. I'll block your number. I've got too many people that want to change. I am not called to the unteachable. I, I have had so many instructions from this man. And I have, for the most part, I have obeyed what he told me. I am teachable. And I have changed. And I intend to do some more changing. How many are glad about that? That Gary's going to do more changing. I'm, you just, I'm more glad about that than you're glad about that. But you see what it says? You shun profane and vain babblings. Well, how do you shun them? Because people ask them all the time. People ask me the most, I won't say stupid stuff. <laughs> that would be unkind. No, they're stupid stuff. They would... <laughs> stuff that doesn't amount to a hill of beans. But do you think the robes were three inches off the floor? Or were they one inch off the floor? Robes from the Old Testament. The priestly robe. Was it three inches off the floor or was it one inch off? I mean, just stuff. I'm, I'm being a little bit ridiculous, but stuff just about that nuts. And I have a standard answer for that. I said, well, I'll answer that question if you can tell me Paul's shoe size. Because the answers to both have about that much to do with your walk with God. It's got nothing to do with you serving Jesus today. See? You shun profane, profane babblings. And their word will eat as doth a cancer, a canker, of whom is Hymenus and Philetus, those two guys, who concerning the truth have erred. But you notice it didn't keep them from preaching it. That's what I mean. There's ministers who are not approved of God. Here's two of them. They're not approved. They wrongly divided the word, and they're leading people astray. It's not a good thing to get promoted yourself when the Lord doesn't promote you. I'll tell you right now, you do this message, and all hell can't keep you from being promoted. Amen. When, God, when God comes to promote you, what's hell going to do to stop it? The danger is you promoting yourself. How did Dave say that? Alan says it. You know, how do, I, how do I get meetings? I think Alan tells this story, you know. 
Pastor Dave, how do I get meetings? And there's all, I mean, you know, you get counsel from other, well, you take your business cards to conferences or you call in the phone book, you look up all of the word of faith, pre, you know, all of these different things, you know, and Dave, Dave, he asked Dave, and Dave says, if they're not calling you, God isn't. You're not ready yet. Keep praying. Keep fasting. Keep studying to show yourself approved. When God's ready to promote you, Man nor hell can keep it from happening. Doggone, I'm preaching good. Hallelujah. This doggone okay? I hope it's okay. Well, these guys were not approved, but they're preaching. But boy, I love verse 19. Well, I love it all, but verse 19. Nevertheless, the foundation of God stands sure, having this seal. The Lord knows them that are his and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity see one of the most scariest verses in the Bible is over in Matthew 7 not everyone that says unto me Lord Lord shall enter into the kingdom of heaven but those that do the will of my father and they're going to say things like Lord didn't we cast out devils in thy name didn't we do this in thy name and do that in thy name and he says depart from me for I never knew you ye that work iniquity now if you call yourself I'll just preach to me Gary if you're going to call yourself a Christian you need to depart from iniquity and I mean all of it a definition for departing from iniquity a term you might use for that is sanctified. Would that be a good word? If you're going to depart from iniquity, don't you get sanctified, set apart from the world? And then he starts talking about these vessels. We finally made it to the vessels here. But in a great house, that's the house of God, but in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver. Alan just did a masterful job this morning. I mean, let me finish reading it. But also of wood and of earth, or let's say clay. Some to honor, some to dishonor. Now, Alan was using the analogy of Tupperware to China. Every woman has Tupperware bowls, and she has the finer China type things, you know. Then you usually got stuff all in between. He says, he has never seen, he asked the question, women, which of you women in your, China, in your cabinet, you have your Tupperware and right, uh, stacked together, your Tupperware and your China all in one stack. That never happens. At our house, you got the nice dishes here. The Tupperware, we got a drawer down below where all that stuff goes. And when you open the door, everything falls out. But anyway, <laughs> see, see, everybody knows what I'm talking about. You open the door, what happens? All of that stuff comes rolling out. You got to put it back in there and get the one you want. You know what I was thinking of when he was teaching on that? My favorite vessel, one of my favorite vessels at my house is an old wheelbarrow I've had for 25 years. That thing is so old. I mean, it's got the handles... They're, they're wood, but they're gray and cracked. I keep wondering when I'm going to lift that thing and they're just going to break. I mean, they're so old. Uh, that, that tub, I have spray painted it again and again, but you know, it gets rusty over the years. And I got to thinking, man, I have had everything from dog poop, <laughs> fertilizer, dirt. I mean, you just name it, the everything. That's a vessel, but it's useful. It's one of the most useful vessels I've ever had around. I mean, I use that thing for everything. But I'll tell you what I don't want. I don't want to sit down at the supper table and here comes Sue with my wheelbarrow full of pot roast and carrots and potatoes. <laughs> now, it's a useful vessel. It's in my house. I don't even want you taking my wheelbarrow. That's my wheelbarrow. See? But we don't use it to serve the roast beef and potatoes. It has its function. Now, this is an amazing thing. This next part here. Who turned the page? <laughs> Chapter 2. <clears throat> In a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also wood and earth. Some to honor, some to dishonor. 
Now, he's not talking really about vessels here, is he? He's talking about people. Now, this is an ima- I'm going to read it first and then talk about it. If a man, therefore, purge himself, if you underline, purge himself. I'm waiting. I'm hoping you see. Let me read it a different way. So if a man waits until God purges him. What? What? That's not what it says? Now I'm just waiting until God purges me and then I'll depart from iniquity. No. If a man purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor Now, here's the word for my lesson, for this lesson, sanctified. You see it? Now, a wheelbarrow cannot go from being a wheelbarrow to being China. I mean, I don't see that in Scripture. (laughs) But he's not talking about wheelbarrows, is he? He's talking about us. He said, you know, it's really up to you. I'll use you right where you are, you little unsanctified outfit. I have wheelbarrow purposes in my kingdom. And I can use you right where you're at. You got that? You say, well, I don't want to just be a wheelbarrow. Now, we have something available to us that the wheelbarrow does not. Wheelbarrow can't change. I like how Alan said that. I can paint that wheelbarrow. I can clean it. I can use rust-oleum. That's a high dollar paint, you know. I can can work on that wheelbarrow. I can do all kinds of things. I could paint daisies around it, you know, and little flowers. But you know what? It's still a wheelbarrow. But see, the the wonder, we have the ability to metamorpho. You remember metamorpho? Be you transformed, be you metamorphosized. And what is the number one we always think of? It's a caterpillar that becomes a butterfly. See, he's not wanting to make you, and this is religion. He is not wanting to leave you a butterfly. Excuse me. He is not wanting to leave you a wheelbarrow that's all painted up, but still a wheelbarrow. He's wanting to metamorpho you (laughs) to where you literally become something different than you were before. Now, he's already done that in your spirit. See, if you remember Romans 12, 1 and 2, where that verse is, that you be no longer conformed to this world, but that you be transformed by the renewing of your spirit? No, by the renewing of your mind. Now, that brings us study to show thyself approved. Let God's Word transform your mind. By that process, your path is going to get narrower. By that process, you'll stop doing wheelbarrow things, and you'll become maybe Tupperware things, and then maybe you'll become everyday wear things, and eventually you'll become fine china things. That's what he's saying. You don't have to stay where you are. Now, he'll use you where you are. He loves you where you are. The thief on the cross made paradise. But how many of you knows if he'd have lived longer, he wouldn't have stayed no thief? Okay, let me go on. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor. Now, I love this word sanctified. We're going to look at sanctified in a moment. And meet... For the master's use. And prepared unto every good work. Now in the context here. What if Hymenus and Philetus. Had not jumped the gun. And started preaching. And ministering. Ahead of time. That's what happened. They exalted themselves. They were not ready yet. They were wrongly dividing the word, and they literally were leading people astray. 
and leading them into ungodliness. I don't have time to... I know a lot about that message they were preaching, but that's not today, okay? He's saying, don't do that. If a man purge himself, don't you wish there was a church? Don't you wish there was some place you could go and learn how you might purge yourself by turning yourself over to the Holy Spirit? And allowing that Holy Spirit to examine every room of the soul and shine that light in there. And every time he finds dirt, then you have the ability to get rid of that. Don't you wish there was a church that would teach you how to purge yourself? Ah, wait a minute. <laughs> we are at that church. But it's still going to be up to you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now, this brings me. I've still been studying... John G. Lake, I, b I believe in studying men who made it. See, I don't care anything much about studying Hymenus and Philetus. I'm not interested in leading the church of God astray. But I am interested in finding men and women who made it into what we're after and seeing if I can learn anything that they learned along the way. Okay? Okay. So I'm going to read you some things from John G. Lake, direct quotes, some of it direct quotes, when it comes to his experience regarding sanctification. Okay? He says, sanctification is calculated to apply to the needs of all our nature. First to the spirit. See, you're, if you're born again, your spirit is sanctified. There is a holy of holies on the inside of you that you receive free by grace. You couldn't earn it. You couldn't cause it to happen. Jesus did all the work to make it happen. And when you receive him as your savior and he, his spirit comes into you, you go from death to life. And in your spirit, you are sanctified from the world. You are a called out one. You are set apart from the world. You are a new creature. Amen? But we're not talking about that. We're talking about the sanctification of the soul today. And really, that's going to wind up being the sanctification of your body, which he talks about here. So I'm going to start again. Sanctification is calculated to apply to all the needs of all our nature. First to the spirit, second to the soul, third to the body, wrote Lake. Over and over again, I have repeated those blessed words of John Wesley. How many of you know who he's talking about? John Wesley, who uh, is a great preacher. In his definition of sanctification, now here's John Wesley's definition. Sanctification is possessing the mind of Christ and all the mind of Christ. So let me say it again. Sanctification is possessing the mind of Christ and all the mind of Christ. And I'm going to come back to that in just a minute. Let me go on a little more here. Lake wrote, I learned by the word of God and experienced in my own life the sanctifying power of God and subduing the soul and cleansing the nature from sin. The, this inward life, excuse me, this inward life cleansing was to me the crowning work of God in my life during that period. And I shall never cease to praise God that he revealed to me the depth by the Holy Ghost of the power of the blood of Jesus. A beautiful anointing of the Spirit was upon my life. Now listen to this. Isn't it marvelous, beautiful, and wonderful to realize that mankind can receive into their nature and being the power and spirit of the living Christ which contains the purging power to drive forth from the being every particle of evil every sensuous thing in the thought and nature so that the man becomes as Jesus is you think like him, you act like him, 
You walk like him. You talk like him. You have the same results he had. Back to Lake. He said, that is what the blood of Jesus is calculated to do. That is what the Spirit of Christ is purposed to do in the soul of man. The cleansing of the nature from the power and the dominion of sin. The presence of Christ in the souls of men can only produce the purity that is in him. Purity is of God. Purity is the nature of Christ. Lake believed that sanctification removes that detestable thing that causes sin. That old man, the nature. And he emphasized that Jesus came to take away the sin of the world. Go to 2 Corinthians just for a moment. See, because the way it says up here, it says what we read in Paul's letter to Timothy. It says, if a man purge himself. But here he's talking about this nature of Christ, the blood of Jesus, being able to purge our soul from every wicked thing. Now, don't get... God, I mean, I, I see, I've read so many of Lake's writings. I'm going to expand a little bit. Lake is not saying you will never be tempted. Jesus was tempted in all points like we are. Yet Jesus walked 100% victorious over temptation. And what he's saying is, so can we. Well, 2 Corinthians chapter 10 gives you a great insight from the, this same apostle who wrote both letters. And really the same insight from the Holy Ghost. As to how you do that. How do you purge yourself? Because there, apparently there's a, there is a, it's the nature of Christ that does it. But there is a activity on our part where we purge ourselves from these things this, this I believe is one of the answers right here 2 Corinthians chapter 10 I'm going to for context sake I'll, start, sake I'll start in verse 1 now I Paul myself beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ who in presence am base among you but being absent and bold towards you but I beseech you that I may not be bold when I am present with that confidence wherewith I think to be bold against some, which think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. It's taking all my restraint not to preach right there. <laughs> That's another message. Verse 4. This is where we're after. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Now let me stop for just a moment. Now, what he's about to say, really, he is talking about his ministry to the Corinthians. If you leave it all in context, he is coming against the false apostles who were there in all of their fine robes and driving the Lexus donkeys of the day. And uh, they, were, they were trying to impress with, their, their, uh, with the methods of the flesh. You ought to listen to us. Don't you want to be blessed like us? Don't you want to have a camel like mine? Don't you want to have robes like mine? They were trying to impress with tools of the flesh. Paul says, I am not interested in that. So ultimately what he's talking about here is the weapons I'm coming with are not those. I'm going to bring to you the truth of God and the anointing of the Holy Ghost. But this next thing he says is also you can take it internally. This is how you purge yourself. Let me show you what I mean. He says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Now notice, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Now notice this. And bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of of Christ. You want to purge yourself? Don't wait till the act happens. Purge yourself with the thought. When the thought comes, that's when you act. Cast it down. 
This is not who I am. I am a child of God. Your flesh is not saved. And through the flesh is going to come all kinds of what it thinks are reasonable suggestions. You've been under a lot of pressure. You know, if you don't, if you don't have a, a little drink today, you might just explode. You know, even Paul said, take a little wine. You know, he'll start using scripture. Take a little wine for that time. Yeah, before long, if you entertain that thought, now that first time, maybe you just, maybe you just took a little sip, you know. And there's no, hey, the Bible doesn't really say you can't touch it. It just says, don't get drunk with it. But I'm telling you right now, <laughs> some of us can't handle it. I being one of them. I took my last drink of alcohol in 1980, and my life has been much better without it. Okay? Now, I'm not telling you you can't, but I'm telling you I won't. He's, I, I've been purged, and I ain't going back. And I'll sit right next to you while you sip it, and I won't say a word. I don't care. I don't care. I, I've been around people that, you know, they sip a little wine, don't ever get drunk. Well, okay, I ain't doing it. If that bothers you, I'm sorry. You know, let me have my coffee. I don't judge you if you don't drink coffee. Let me drink my coffee. You can have your wine, you know. See, the, the, what I'm really trying to say is quit trying to impose. Don't be other people's judge. We're talking about you and your thoughts. We're talking about you and your walk with the Holy Ghost. We're talking about you and your walk really at this point with the new nature. Your flesh will come up with all. I'm going to go worse than that. It's tax season. How many days we got left? Was it Tuesday this year? And there's people today. They're going to be trying to finish up their taxes. And there's going to be all kinds of suggestions from the flesh. Well, really, that ought to be a write-off. Yeah, that ought to be deductible. What was it? Apple pie. I bought <laughs> You know, I bought for myself. Or I, what I'm telling you, there's going to be temptation to cheat on your taxes. Well, that's iniquity. It's not the truth. God will help you pay your taxes. Fill out your forms honestly. I'm going to go worse than that. No, 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 no. I'm not looking at anybody. Please don't think just because I know stuff that I'm talking about you. <laughs> You really love that girl. I mean, you know, this is for single people, you know, single people. You really love that girl, boy. You know, you know, someday you're going to get married. Y'all don't really have to wait. You can go ahead and have sex now. That's called the fornication. That's called sin. And it's never okay. It's not the unforgivable sin, but it is sin. It is a, that is helping make you a clay pot. Yeah, I'm not saying you're not saved, but I'm saying you're a clay pot. You're like my wheelbarrow. Now, if you live, that's if you do it once or, you know, if you, you shouldn't even do it. It says, let it not be named once. But if you habitually live there, you ain't going to heaven. If Gary, do you have chapter and verse? Oh, we could for hours. Those that do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. We're going to be preaching more about the fear of God. This generation has lost the fear of God. There is a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. And there's not enough preaching on it today. All the messages are, he loves you and you should feel good and have a nice life. He does love you. I hope you do feel good. I hope you have a nice life. Maybe while they're beating you as you're witnessing to Muslims. That's a great life. You martyr. Uh, what, what did he say to Peter? <laughs> they're going to. He didn't say crucify. They're going to kill you for my name's sake. You're gonna, th he was telling him by what death he would glorify God. When I found that out, it changed my. I have a prophecy from the Lord. When we first got ordained, it says, "It's a glorious end I have for you, my son." 
in, in the early days, I thought, man, we're going to have houses and cars and fine things and a worldwide ministry until I found out how Peter glorified God with his death. Peter had a glorious end. I went, oh, God. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> What's sad is that after we've been at this this long, at the prayer center, we still have to talk about sanctification. It is sad. If, I think sometimes God would almost have to apologize to Israel. He called them stick, stiff, not stick, not stick necked, <laughs> stiff necked and rebellious. And what happened to them, that first bunch that came out of Egypt? I mean, they come out of Egypt. Would you call it saved? They come out of the world, type and shadow, baptized through the uh, Red Sea, come up on the other side, that the type and shadow, come on. And what happened to that bunch? They didn't obey God, wouldn't believe God. Perished in the wilderness. I do not want to be of that bunch. And it's a shame that we're still having to talk about even walking, let me just say sanctification at this point. Yes, sir. When I say yes, sir, it's because I'm hearing him. And he's giving me instructions, and my job is not to disobey. You see that? I could go on there, but he's got something else he wants to say now. I want to talk about the life in you and the anointing in you. The life and the anointing. See, I know that I'm born again. You, 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 could, you couldn't beat it out of me with rifle butts. I know in whom I have believed. I, I know I'm saved. I, at this point, I know i got God the Holy Ghost living inside of me. For the life of me, I don't know why he has so much trouble getting out. That's my question to him. What I mean by that is to manifest the Father's will, to heal the sick and raise the dead and cast out devils. We see some success, but it still reminds me of that old song, Mercy drops around us are falling, but for the showers we plead. I don't even want showers. I want a river. I want a river. He said, out of your belly will flow rivers. I want the rivers of life flowing, don't we all? So I keep praying, and he keeps showing me these things. See, we could go to... Uh, Christ, what is the, mis the mystery of the gospel? Christ in you. Do you notice it doesn't say Jesus? Now, sometimes in the New Testament, it does talk about Jesus. But normally, normally, it's either Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus, Lord Jesus. Very seldom do you just see Jesus. And I'm talking about after, after Acts in the epistles. There is a couple of exceptions, but that's not my lesson today. We use that term, Jesus Christ, so much that we tend to, without realizing it, we just think it's like his last name, Jesus Christ. Let me read a paragraph. Christ is not Jesus' last name. <laughs> In English, we often say Jesus Christ as if that were so. But it means Jesus, the Anointed One. If we were still in the Old Testament, we would say Jesus, the Messiah. But the word Messiah means anointed one. Got it? There was a time, now think about this. Let's meditate. There was a time in the life of Jesus, the man. Now, the man. Let's talk about the man Jesus. I know, no, he is the second member of God. I don't, okay. Let's talk about the man. The one that was born in the womb of Mary. The one that grew up and grew in stature and favor with, with God and there was a time in the life of Jesus, the man. Let's go start the car, baby, before I say this next sentence. There was a time in the life of Jesus, the man, where he was not anointed. Well, for the first 30 years. For the first 30 years, he didn't heal the sick. Didn't raise the dead. Didn't cast out no devils. Now, those of you that still kind of think the Apocrypha might be right, there's a reason why it was taken out. Those, 
You know, they say things in there like Jesus, when he was a little boy, about seven, he took a dead bird, prayed for it, and the bird flew off. No, he did not. He absolutely did not do that either. The book of John tells you that when he turned the water into wine, that was the beginning of miracles. That was the first one. So there was a time when he grew up where he had, now remember, his first life, the life that was conceived in him in the womb of Mary, did not come from Adam. Your life did. My life did. His was different. That's why for a season he calls him the only begotten of the Father. Out of all the people on planet Earth, when he was conceived, he, when he was born, he was the only begotten of the Father at that point. No other human, and no human had for 2,000 years since the fall of Adam, had, when they were born, had that life of God. So let me say it this way. His first nature was what we got at our second birth. <laughs> our second nature was his first nature. See, I, I, what, I don't know what it would be like to be born with the nature of God from an infant. See, Gary didn't really get saved, really come to God until he was 33 years old. So I had a lifetime of being, my mind had been trained by a dead spirit, <laughs> A death nature for 33 years. Now, my, don't get me wrong. My parents did their best. I'm hearing that old song, Mama Tried. But <laughs> turned 20 years. See, I, I anyway. Do, I, tw he, he turned 20 in prison doing life without parole. But Mama Tried. <laughs> I know that. Man. <laughs> Mama tried. Well, you know, your parents do their best to put in you a conscience if they're good parents, so you have an artificial conscience, but that conscience is not really your nature. That artificial conscience is to try and restrain that nature. I don't know what it would be like to be born like Jesus was born with the very nature of God on the inside of him. He wasn't trained by a sin nature. Hmm. But during that time, yeah, he had the nature of God on the inside. But he was not baptized in the Holy Ghost for 30 years. He had the life of God in his spirit. And he walked in the light of that life, sin-free, even though, our Bible tells us, he was tempted in all points as we are. Now, I've been teaching a lot about the candle and the flaming tornado. Jesus is our pattern. Jesus was born with his candle lit. No tornado yet. No baptism in the Holy Ghost. If you can picture Jesus, the first candle. See, Proverbs tells you the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. But when Adam sinned, he still had a spirit, but the light went out. You got that? Jesus was born with the candle lit. And he walked in. The, here's the power of the candle. Here's the power of the new birth. Without the baptism in the Holy Ghost, he walked in the light of that life within. And just the power of the candle is the light of the new birth, the light of the life of God is enough to walk sin free. But you're not anointed. That's not the anointing. That's walking in the light. That's walking in the light of the new nature. And it is powerful. When Dave would teach on this on the Born Again Trail, he said, if you ever really understand who you are and that spirit of life that's on the inside of you, your flesh will think it's been run over by a steamroller. The power that's in that new nature is um, huge compared to that tiny power of the flesh. Doesn't feel like that when you're tempted, does it? But it is. I got to meditating on this. Now here's Jesus, 30 years, not baptized in the Holy Ghost, yet he had complete power over sin. I got to meditating this. I don't know if you've ever had this thought. Had Jesus never been baptized in the Holy Spirit, what sort of gospel would we have? Now remember Hebrews chapter 12, we're looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Well, what if he was never baptized in the Holy Ghost? 
what kind of gospel would we have? And I just started writing down. Jesus lived a sinless life, and so can we. How about this? Same thing worded a little different. Jesus lived a holy life. So can we. Jesus walked in love. So can we. Jesus could forgive others. Well, so can we. Jesus gave to the poor. So can we. How about this one? Jesus always spoke the truth. So can we. This is all candle work. This is not, this is not tornado work. This is not Holy Spirit work. This is candle work. Jesus had courage to speak against religious error. Well, so can we. Remember, he stood up at age 12, bar mitzvah, stood up in the temple declaring the truth. And even those there, the, the experts of the day, they marveled that such wisdom would come from a 12-year-old. Isn't that amazing? He's not baptized in the Holy Ghost. He was studying to show himself approved. Which I don't totally understand that but because he is the word made flesh. But anyway, <laughs> I don't want my brain leaking out my left ear. We're going to move on. Now, if that's the only gospel that we had, and if he'd have gone ahead and died as the Lamb of God, we could all be born again, couldn't we? And we could live the same way he lived. But without the baptism in the Holy Ghost, what's scary... <laughs> Listen to how I'm going to say. But without the baptism in the Holy Ghost, we wouldn't be able to cast out any devils, and we wouldn't be able to heal the sick, and we wouldn't be able to raise the dead. Problem is, from 99% of the church, that is the case. Can't cast out devils, can't raise the dead. Lay hands on the sick and they die anyway. We've got to understand sanctification is a major part. Of walking, let's see, just let me put it this way. Let me put it this way. He gave us more than a candle. Thank God for the candle. Thank God for the new birth that enables us to do all these things that we've just said. But He did not intend for us to walk powerless through this dark world. He did not intend for us to walk by and leave the sick the way they are, the insane the way they are, the, the depressed the way they are, the cripples the way they are. That is not our Jesus. That's not the Jesus that we're to pattern ourselves at or after. After he was baptized in the Holy Ghost, it says, who went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Then he turns right around to us and says, if you can believe it, the works that I do, you're going to do the same works. And even greater than these, because I go to my Father. Hmm. All right? So in this vision I've been telling you all about, first I saw the candle. There's, let's look at Jesus. There he is, perfect, pure, walking in the light of that candle. Thank God we've got a pattern, something to aspire to. Because... This was the other thing Dave said that just killed me dead. He says, we'd like to think that Jesus, the life that was in him, was way more than what we received when we got born again. Or maybe let's tone it down a little. Let's just, let's just take Paul. And we'd like to think that Paul, he must have received more at his new birth than what we received. But see, Romans chapter 8 will tell you the same life that raised Jesus from the dead is the very life that he put in you. It is the same life, not something diminished. So first we had the candle, and I see Jesus. Now with your mind, see Jesus like that candle on a desert plain. There's Jesus. Then all of a sudden, here comes the baptism in the Holy Ghost. And in the vision I saw it, it was like, first I described it as a fire tornado. You know, it was this living, swirling, fire. You know, John says, the one that's coming after me whose shoe latched I'm not worthy to unloose. I says, I baptize you in water, but he's coming, 
And he's going to baptize you in the Holy Ghost and with fire. And I saw, there's the candle. And then all of a sudden, at Jesus' baptism, he, John baptized him in water, but he got baptized in fire. There was like a pillar of fire. That's the Holy Ghost. And in my vision, the two became one. I never really thought about it with Jesus until recently. It was just me and the Holy Ghost. But he's trying to get across to us what happened to him is what happened to you. So now if you can see, and in that vision I saw, I, first there was the candle lit. Then there was the tornado, or let's call it a, the pillar of fire. I can't get across to until you see it in your spirit, the awesomeness of that pillar. And the sound of it, it's not quiet. You ever hear a tornado? It's not quiet. And then suddenly, suddenly, there's the candle and there's the tor flaming tornado. And the two become one. And I can see the candle. It did, the, that flaming pillar of fire did not consume the candle. I could still see that candle lit on the inside of there, but the two became one. When Jesus was baptized in it now, yes, sir, go to Luke 4. Luke 4. Actually, I've already got these on my paper. So. Hmm. I'm gonna We're going to look at Luke, Matthew, and Mark. The same event. And it's Luke 4, Matthew 4, and Mark chapter 1 if you want to get ahead or just just listen <laughs> so Luke chapter 4 verses 1 and 2 now this is right after he got baptized in the Holy Ghost and Jesus being full of the Holy Ghost returned from Jordan and Luke says it this way and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness being 40 days tempted of the devil. And in those days he did eat nothing. And when they were ended, ended he afterward hungered. All right, go to, go to Matthew 4. Verse 1. Same event. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Got that? Mark chapter 1, same event. He says it this way. Verse 12. And immediately, right after his baptism, the Spirit, now this is even more forceful, the Spirit driveth him into the wilderness. And what happened in the wilderness? Got tempted by the devil. Now, there's three different words. Each one of these authors... See, I used to think there was a big problem because two of them says he was led by the Spirit and then this third one says the Spirit driveth him. And it is three different Greek words. But they're not as dissimilar as you think. Let's start with Mark's version, Mark 1.12. Where it says the Spirit, we're going to do micro a little bit. Where it says the Spirit driveth him, that's Strong's G1544. It, the Greek word is ekbalo, E-K-B-A-L-L-O. It literally means to eject. All right, so if a, if a pilot's in a jet airplane and he hits eject, you know what that means, right? Poo! <laughs> Gone, right? Like that, all right? But in, Mark, in Matthew's account, Matthew 4, 1, where it says Jesus was led up, led up of the Spirit, that's Strong's G321. And the word is A-N-A-G-O. And it means to lead up, bring out, launch forth. How about launch forth? Does that sound like eject? But my favorite one on this one, though, the most common use of it is to sail away. The Holy Spirit is described as a wind. <laughs> when you get baptized in the Holy Ghost, your sail goes up. But the Holy Ghost is the one 
that fills that say, oh, God. excuse me, I'm, I'm, how you can not love the word is beyond me. <laughs> Lord. Now, in, but in Luke's account, the, the, uh, in English it says, and he was led and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. The word there is Strong's G71. It's A-G-O. And it means to lead, to bring, or to drive. Now, look up at me for a minute. I know some of you are writing, but this is important. For the video's sake, my left hand is the candle. This is the Spirit of Christ. 30 years, 30 years, without the baptism in the Holy Ghost, no pillar of fire, the lit candle, he was able to walk sin free, able to walk in love, can I say able to hear God? I didn't put that one in there. Able to hear God? Be taught by God? Uh, able to forgive? So, mu so much we could talk about just the power of the candle. But now notice this. One day here comes the baptism in the Holy Ghost. And if you can't see me, I'm holding up a finger on my right hand. I should hold up a towering, flaming tornado, but I don't know how to do that. <laughs> But now watch. Suddenly, with that baptism, they become one. Jesus, the man, has been baptized in the pillar of fire. Now, here's the question. Who decides where Jesus goes next? Hmm? Whether you call it led, lead, sailed, or driven, by the Spirit. There it is. It is the real baptism in the Holy Ghost is when you surrender your life to God. What did that baptism mean? Why did it happen at Jesus' baptism? I've told you many times how the Holy Spirit taught me. That baptism, even John didn't know why Jesus came to be baptized. He says, I need, Lord, I need to be baptized by you. But Jesus said, no, it, it behooves us to fulfill all righteousness. What he meant by that, no, you don't know what's going on here, John, but my father does. And what happened there, this was a visual vow. See, Jesus was a man. You've got to understand what this whole temptation was about. The first man fell when he was tempted. And the devil is going to tempt this last one. And his, he's thinking, hey, I brought down the first one. I'll bring this one down too. This last Adam has to succeed where the first Adam failed. Well, what is this vow? Jesus and the Father knows what's going on. The Father's looking on Jesus' heart. Jesus is surrendering completely. He was a man. He could have had a right to a family. He could have, he could have got married, had kids, had the best carpenter shop in all of Jerusalem <laughs> or Bethlehem or wherever. Well, you understand what I mean? But this day is his total surrender to the will of his Father. When John lays me down in this water, that's a type of death. It's a type of the grave. Father, I know why you sent me. I was born to die for the sin of the world. Father, when John lays me down, that is my vow to you. I surrender to your will completely. My whole life is yours. I'm not here, any, I'm not here to do my will. I'm here to do your will, Father. This... This baptism for me means do with me as you will. I surrender. But when John raised him up, but when you surrender like that, if God does not intervene, you're there forever. But when John raises me back up, Father, that is my faith in your word where you promised you would not leave my soul in hell. Neither would my flesh see corruption, Father. I'm trusting you because I can't do it. I'm trusting you to raise me from the dead. Oh, God, feet stay here. Come on, finish. God. That total surrender. Then the Holy Spirit says, Oh, this is the life that I anoint with dominion. This is the life, the surrendered life is the life.
that I anoint with dominion. And then he got tested. He didn't tell the Holy Spirit where they were going. No, the Holy Spirit led him, drove him, ejected him. I like this one. The Holy Spirit filled his sail with the direction of God. We're going into the wilderness. No, the flesh. No. No, there's a devil out there. I know. <laughs> now, thank God for the Lord's prayer. Father, lead us not into temptation. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but Jesus had to be. The, first, the last Adam had to succeed where the first Adam failed. But the point I want you to understand, the surrendered life, the more surrendered that we are, the more the Holy Ghost directs our path. And the more you're going to find the anointing shows up in your life. By that process, we can go from a Tupperware, we can go from a wheelbarrow to a Tupperware, to everyday, everyday plates. I like how Alan said, to the Christmas plates. <laughs> the very best you have. But he'll use you all along the way. But he is wanting to bring us into the, where the blind see, the deaf hear, the lame walk. See, he's only been able to do that by the gifts. And I say only, I don't mean to disparage the gifts. Thank God for the gifts. We're supposed to covet the gifts, but we're supposed to go beyond that. But the more surrendered you are, the more as you're led by the Spirit, the more the Holy Ghost can manifest the will of the Father through you. Okay, that's enough for today. Did you get anything out of that? I did myself. I did myself. Hallelujah. Now, oh, okay. I think I saw. Okay, nope, nope, nope. One more time, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. It starts here. It doesn't start with raising the dead. It starts here. He wants to sanctify us. And part of that sanctification, it's the surrender starts in verse 5. 2 Corinthians 10, 5. Casting down imaginations. And every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Your soul has to bow. Your soul has to say obedience. My soul must obey Christ. If my soul does not obey Christ... It is not sanctified. This is how I do it. And it starts with the thought. If I cut off the thought, I cut off the act. And I am purged of iniquity. For benefit of those watching, let's, let's pray. How many want to surrender a little more? Let, let, let's do a surrender prayer. Father, this day, just say it after me. Father, this very day, I understand surrender a little better than I did before. Lord, there's things in my life that I know have to go. Lord, this day, I am surrendering my will, and I vow to you to start taking control of my thoughts. Whenever a thought that's not of you comes into my mind, I will cast it down. I intend to obey my Lord Jesus. I know now it starts with the thought. And I cast it down. I'll say, that's not a part of me. That's not for a child of God. I reject that. For I walk holy as my Lord is holy. Father, I know you'll help me by your life and by your spirit. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.